Good morning. My name is Virgil Wood. I am one of the founders of the Jubilee National Collaborative. Uh, and uh, today uh, we are delighted that we could share this time together. In just eight days from today will be April 4, exactly 50 years from the day Martin Luther King was taken from us. And that time, it's his first jubilee, the first complete 50 years of his absence. When he left, he raised the question, where do we go from here? Today, we will be looking at the whole issue of uh, inequality, and we are fortunate to have presenting for us at this time, uh, Dr. Robin C. Sickles, uh, professor at uh, Rice University. Uh, good morning, Ralph, uh, um, uh, Robin, it's so good to have you. Good morning, Virgil. Uh, I'm glad that uh, I could be uh, a part of uh, this amazing uh, jubilee and uh, uh, look forward to uh, comments and, uh, and uh, communication with others that might be listening. Um, I uh, just wanted to, as a disclaimer, uh, point out that uh, until uh, you and I met some years ago, my yeah. efforts in this regard were, were zero. Uh, that you, you have a very strong uh, will that got me involved in uh, income inequality because of, <laughs> of our conversations. Yes, thank you. So do you want me to go ahead and uh, begin? Yes, that'd be fine. Okay, so uh, presumably uh, those of you that are uh, involved in this uh, can see the... the, the uh, first page of my slides here. And uh, of course, this is on income inequality in the United States. Uh, the uh, person, of course, is me. Uh, I do have a, a website that I can share with you, um, which is, uh, if I have it correct, right there. So I'm this person. You're not seeing me because I'm going to be rustling through a number of uh, documents. So uh, but I'm, uh, I'm there. If you just Google my name, it's, there's, a, there's not too many of me, and uh, you can easily find this uh, website with, uh, of course, a variety of things that I've done and, uh, and are doing. So let me go back from that and get back to this. So um, what I want to talk about in the time I have is uh, how... Uh, Productivity growth uh, drives uh, inequality growth, and I, you know, it's it's obviously a uh, a back and forth. These are not just uh, one directional uh, issues, but uh, it's a, to some extent you could think of this as a relationship between income inequality and uh, productivity growth. You might ask um, why uh, productivity growth, and in fact, so uh, I guess that behooves me to define what. Uh, Formally, productivity growth is. Uh, productivity growth is a, uh, uh, it's also referred to as multi-factor productivity. Um, it's the percentage change in the proportion of output not explained by traditionally measured inputs, which we typically think of as labor and capital. Of course, I'm an economist, so I'm going to be trying to not be too technical, but some of this material, of course, uh, has some technical aspects to it. I, by the way, uh, am a uh, I guess recovering engineer. I started out in aerospace engineering at Georgia Tech, uh, moved into economics uh, rather late in the game, and uh, have migrated up to George Washington University to Wharton and have been at uh, Rice for the last uh, 33 years now. Uh, but essentially, productivity is, is um, what is left over when all of the input factors are paid for. It's taken as a measure of the economy's long-term technical change or technological dynamism. It also has components which uh, relate to efficiency as well as technical change. And uh, I'm going to be using that concept uh, as distinct from uh, economic growth, where economic growth, uh, you know, is your standard uh, that you see in, in uh, all of your uh, business uh, informative uh, publications, uh, GDP, gross domestic profit, let's say per capita or uh, just growth in general. Um, 
that is not what I'm going to be focusing on. And, and the reason I'm not is that um, there is a long-standing view that economic growth is the most powerful instrument for reducing poverty and economic growth in the context of specifically productivity growth. Um, that relationship uh, is, a, is a very strong one, uh, and I'll, I'll discuss that uh, a bit uh, in a minute. Um, so let me try to at least uh, recognize uh, through a picture, and of course pictures to some extent are summaries, but they also may uh, may be a, a bit distracting. Um, I'm attempting here <laughs> to show that there are uh, levels of uh, productivity growth. These come from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the uh, OECD, uh, uh, the IMF uh, staff estimates, as well as uh, independent uh, estimates. And that uh, sort of shaded area that you see uh, in back of the red up and down, and TFP growth tends to be uh, rather um, bumpy, uh, are the ranges of estimates for uh, TFP growth, and those are percentage changes uh, per year. So it uh, corresponds to real output growth, real being, of course, uh, growth that's been deflated by the uh, price deflator, to give us a sense of how much more purchasing power the economy has. And you'll see that in, air, in at times when the uh, real growth is relatively low, you see relatively low uh, total factor productivity growth in, air, in times during which the uh, economy appears to be growing at a faster rate. Those total factor productivity growth rates increase. Those are the uh, black bars. And of course, you see in the last uh, period, 2005 through 2013, a, uh, a uh, deterioration in the productivity uh, picture. Now, these numbers you can see are going from zero to six or zero to minus five. Um, there are periods during which productivity fell, of course, during the uh, substantial um, contraction after uh, the financial crisis began. Not only did real output growth fall, but also uh, factor productivity appeared to uh, digress uh, to some extent. And that, that of course, is not a, not a good thing. Um, so um, that is a, a picture of that, uh, of that experience. And it, generally, economists agree. And, you know, there's always uh, a consensus, or always economists that, uh, that uh, are in the tails of the distribution, just like in any other uh, set of uh, decisions and set of uh, players. Um, but the, the, the vast consens consensus uh, recognizes the importance of productivity growth in uh, in economic growth in in being able to, to, to provide for increased welfare because it's essentially what's left over and what is then increasing wealth uh, depending of course on how it's distributed and it's that uh, key link that uh, we're going to be focusing on in the next uh, the next minutes here uh, I want to also point out that the uh, the talk today comes from a couple of, uh, of sources, largely from a couple of sources, one of which is a uh, Springer volume that I just uh, finished uh, helping co-edit. This is a uh, proceedings volume from a uh, conference that I have been involved in putting together for many years now, uh, North American Productivity Workshop. This last one, uh, the one that this uh, particular volume comes from had the theme of productivity and inequality. And it was uh, uh, in Ottawa or in Quebec City in, uh, in 2016. In that uh, uh, set of conference uh, papers um, were a series of uh, articles one of which uh, spoke to the allocation of productivity growth and its determinants in the U.S., and it was by uh, a Ph.D. student of mine, Shamsa Liu, uh, myself, and actually one of our PhD, one of our undergraduate honor students, uh, Shi Yi Zhang, who's at uh, in the Ph.D. program now at uh, at Cornell. Uh, that was one that uh, that uh, I'm going to be speaking from. Another was uh, an article uh, or a chapter that was by uh, Mohammed uh, Hamid 
Agar and Malik Soare, uh, Productivity Growth, Poverty Reduction and Income Inequality, New Empirical Evidence. So those two papers are I'm going to be drawing uh, a bit from. I'm also drawing from a uh, volume or from a uh, report, a uh, relatively recent report uh, from the uh, uh, IMF. Uh, this is a report that uh, was co-authored by uh, a number of, uh, of uh, IMF employees, and it spoke to, uh, of course, one of the issues that is the most germane uh, a set of issues to this, uh, to this uh, discussion, and that's the causes and consequences of, of the inequality that, uh, that uh, we are seeing persisting, uh, not only from a uh, perspective of a various countries in the uh, in the world economy but also globally because we'll see that this is not a uh, not a an issue that is uh, unique to America and to North America so uh, that's uh, where those uh, that's where the uh, talk generally is coming from um, and I'll leave that set of slides and just uh, focus on this for a minute. Now, um, I've defined productivity growth. I've explained who I am. Um, what I need to next do is uh, talk about the, uh, the uh, productivity growth that drives inequality growth, the uh, US experience by way of the uh, Liu Sickles and uh, Zhang study the uh, global results that uh, Mohammed and his co-authors uh, have, and, and then this uh, most recent work uh, done in the, uh, in the IMF. So let me, uh, let me begin on that. Um, I might mention as well that one of the concepts that we're going to be discussing is, uh, or using in this discussion of income equality, speaks to what's referred to as a Gini coefficient. Uh, there's a lot of technical uh, terms that are embedded in uh, economic discourse and not, not a small amount of concepts. The Gini coefficient is a, is a well accepted measure of income inequality. It's, uh, it has a mathematical derivation that uh, essentially looks at the cumulative uh, portion of total income earned by the population relative to the cumulative number of people in the population. And if the income in if the income distribution is completely uniform, which is to say everybody gets the same amount, then that, uh, that relationship would uh, essentially be linear. And uh, if it uh, wasn't, then it would be curved with the curve below a 45-degree uh, line. That area between the curve and the 45-degree line is viewed as the extent to which there is uh, in a, a, a inequality. And an uh, inequality that goes up means that uh, you have less uh, equality, and equality that goes down means that you have uh, more. And the number ranges from zero to one. So uh, countries that we think of as uh, having uh, substantial equality, uh, typically those in uh, the Scandinavian countries in particular, have, uh, have Gini coefficients that are on the order of 0.2 to 0.25, countries that are historically uh, very unequal in their distribution uh, would have Gini coefficients on the order of 0.6. And we'll, we'll get back to the use of those Gini coefficients and how you can explain uh, variations in those by way of uh, a variety of factors that we'll, we'll discuss shortly. Um, is, is sort of a game that's played in empirical work. And this is an empirical uh, study or set of studies that I'm going to be uh, pulling uh, my talk from. My area is econometrics and statistics and uh, modeling, and uh, I uh, have a, a very strong amount of, of, of work, both research as well as uh, as well as coursework on productivity and uh, its measurement and uh, specification. I'm just finishing a 800-page Cambridge book on productivity and efficiency. In fact, so that's uh, that's sort of the empirical side of this is is what's uh, what's uh, motivating me. Uh, in, uh, in my uh, talk today. So um, I point out that uh, that uh, in this work that was done by Liu et al, 
um, on the allocation of productivity growth and the determinants of U.S. income inequality. That um, this is based on the panel study of income dynamics uh, data from 1985, 1990, 1995, 1999, 2005, 2009, 2013, which is a substantial amount of, uh, of information. Um, that um, both within and between uh, variations in uh, a variety of factors were, uh, were considered. And um, those that appeared to be the most uh, telling in terms of influencing um, income inequality in the United States uh, focused largely on um, industries that had high technical uh, content, not surprisingly. Uh, education, marriage, race, uh, and gender, but the effects of race and gender uh, seem to have been uh, falling from 85 to 2013. Uh, the residual, uh, uh, which is what's left over, uh, is in fact uh, not inconsequential, uh, unobserved factors that we cannot measure. And of course, these speak to uh, discrimination, these speak to a variety of, uh, of uh, latent uh, tendencies in economies and, and in interpersonal relations and in hiring decisions and a variety of other factors. Those uh, are probably the, the largest <laughs> of, the, uh, of the factors that, uh, that contribute to uh, income inequality. In the uh, work that uh, was done by uh, Muhammad and uh, and uh, SORE in the same volume that uh, productivity of, uh, of uh, text that I mentioned, Productivity and Inequality. Uh, their, uh, again, uh, analysis uh, was focused on a similar kind of decomposition, but it was, uh, it was more of uh, uh, the emerging and developing countries in Asia, Latin America, the Caribbean, and the Sub-Saharan Africa. Um, they found that poverty reducing impacts of productivity growth, which is sort of shoring up this argument about how important productivity growth is, is uh, much stronger in countries with relatively low income inequality. Um, and the countries attempting to reach those objectives of eradicating uh, poverty um, would then be suggested to uh, pursue po uh, policies that uh, foster economic uh, or productivity growth. Um, and that productivity growth is accompanied typically by progressive distributional changes. Um, and when that occurs, it is, of course, even more of a, of a potent uh, elixir for, uh, for uh, reducing uh, income inequality. Um, now, let me, let me move to this uh, more recent uh, work, which is uh, speaking to uh, a global perspective, but we'll also speak to the uh, aspects of inequality that, uh, that, that are specific to uh, North America and the United States. Uh, in the uh, uh, quote uh, of uh, President uh, Obama's, and I'll, I'll focus on <laughs> the era before 2016 in, in part or completely because all the data that we're looking at comes before then. Uh, but I don't think I've been able to find too many comments that speak to uh, uh, the issue or the, the, the negative issue of uh, inequality in, in more recent uh, political discussions, uh, at least uh, by the presidential leadership. Um, rising inequality is a widespread concern. Inequality within most advanced emerging markets in developing uh, countries has increased. These emerging markets in developing countries, by the way, are referred to as EMDCs, and they fall into that, uh, that uh, term, but that's what it's, uh, it's meaning. Um, and it's, it's back in the 2014 uh, Pew's Research Center uh, report that Obama uh, read, interestingly enough, uh, <laughs> he did read, um, uh, called for uh, the widening income inequality as the defining challenge of our time. Uh, that Pew Center found that the gap between the rich and the poor uh, had uh, been viewed as um, a major challenge by more than 60% of respondents worldwide. 
course, uh, this is not surprising. Uh, a number of people have spoken out about it. Uh, Pope Francis, of course, being one. Uh, and that uh, Pew uh, Research Center survey found that although uh, education and, and hard work uh, were viewed as important by these uh, people surveyed, um, the unfortunate aspect of it was that uh, it was also seen to be important uh, that you knew the right persons, you belonged to a wealthy family, and, uh, and there was a substantial uh, suggestions in this uh, in this survey that uh, major hurdles to social mobility existed and not surprisingly then uh, you know the extent to which there is inequality and, and what the drivers of inequality uh, are uh, has has been uh, very hotly debated now you know it's a it's a uh, an ethical and value-based argument but it's also an argument that that needs to be informed by uh, empirical evidence and that is uh, so that's where I'm coming from in, in what I do. Uh, why does it matter? Well, um, of course, why it matters, frankly, is because of valuations in most societies. Uh, it, it is a it is a moral as well as uh, as well as an economic issue. And I'll talk a little bit about the economic aspects of it. Uh, but but specifically as a matter of, uh, of fairness, and it's regardless of the uh, of the ideology, the culture, the religion across the world, people care about inequality. Um, now, you know, it's 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 a signal, uh, clearly, of lack of mobility, income mobility. It's a lack of opportunity, and it's a reflection of persistent disadvantages for particular segments of the uh, society. It also, on the economic side, has been shown uh, that that uh, it has been shown that. Widening inequality has significant implications for growth and uh, economic stability. Uh, if you concentrate political and decision-making power in the hands of a few, you will lead to suboptimal use of human resources. It will tend to cause investment reducing uh, stability or instability and uh, raise uh, risks. Um, and uh, that is, of course, one reason why policymakers should focus uh, on them, and moreover, uh, should po uh, focus on the poor and the middle class. Uh, the IMF, which of course is is charged with with uh, doing their due diligence on uh, lending money to developing countries, uh, has shown that income inequality matters for growth and it matters for its uh, sustainability. The, some of the recent work done by the, the IMF shows that income distribution itself matters for economic growth, not just productivity growth. Uh, one of their findings is that the income share of the top 20%, which one could argue is not the super rich, but the rich, as that increases, GDP growth actually declines uh, over the median term, and going out past the median term is a, is a little little chance of the standard areas of forecasts are, are just wildly uh, large. Uh, but it suggests that the benefits that have been argued by many to trickle down do not. Um, uh, as a contrast, an increase in the income share of the bottom 20%, which they have found via some of the more uh, uh, you know, substantial growth in some of the uh, emerging uh, economies and developed uh, developing economies, is associated with higher economic growth. Poor and the middle class matter the most for growth via a number of interrelated social, economic, and political channels. So the question, of course, is what, what, what explains the divergent trends in inequality across advanced economies? Uh, and that's to some extent what this uh, what the literature is, has been focused on in, in a variety of settings. It's not just uh, at the aggregate level, but uh, labor economists, uh, productivity economists, macro, micro, uh, it's a substantial amount of research uh, uh, being done or, or research uh, agendas for a large number of, uh, of academics and, of course, policy uh, shops. Um, there um, has also been historic or within the last uh, several decades, a disconnect between um, productivity and, uh, and wages. And that disconnect um, to some extent is 
I think, pretty clearly shown in this um, plot. It's a, uh, it comes from the uh, BEA, Bureau of Economic Analysis, uh, Bureau of Labor Statistics. I have a number of PhD students that have worked with both and senior economists. You'll see that uh, from 1973 uh, through 2009, and these have been updated, but the, uh, the, the trends are still, uh, are still there. Uh, basically, we've normalized the uh, indices to be one in 1973, just to see how those trends have, have uh, occurred. And these are real numbers. These are not uh, just inflated. Um, you see how productivity, and this is total productivity, um, has increased and how average compensation um, for males at the median level. Now, medians and means, of course, change considerably, and, and we'll talk a bit about that when we talk about some of the sources of the reasons for inequality, because one of the key reasons is that, uh, is that there has been uh, enormous amounts of wage um, uh, dispersion and inequality, if you will, based on um, people sorting into uh, companies that pay high wages because they have uh, a substantial amount of technical um, capital that they bring with them. And uh, that means that there are, of course, very high wage uh, individuals that tend to increase the average, but don't increase the media, which is, of course, the, uh, the number of 50% above which or 50% below which uh, uh, individuals uh, in comparison uh, earnings, earnings, earnings. These are compensation levels, uh, including a variety of factors that are indirect, uh, indirect wages as well as, uh, as, well as uh, formal, uh, or formal salary or, or, or wages. There are also uh, transfers and uh, social security uh, factored in uh, health benefits, a set of, of other uh, factors that, that make these numbers, I think, comparable. Uh, you see that the compensation from males on, in the median, uh, in fact, went down during the uh, period uh, 1989 through 1999. Uh, compensation median for both has uh, is been more or less stable. Compensation from women has gone up, which is one of the reasons why you see the impact of uh, or the, the explanatory power of, of sex per se being lessened in uh, explaining income inequality, because of course you can see this, uh, this secular trend of median female income relative to males. Now these are not levels, these are just changes. So obviously the levels are still below what they should be from females, controlling for standard sorts of, uh, of uh, experience, what have you. Um, in any event, this is, uh, no, no matter how you slice it, compensation is not keeping up with productivity. There's been a disconnect between productivity and wages. And you see this as well in, the, uh, in a, one of the figures from the uh, report that I, uh, I mentioned. It's uh, coming from the uh, IMF study that um, shows different countries. These are labor productivity specifically, not total factor productivity, total productivity takes in capital as well as uh, labor, but the two tend to be uh, highly linked, not necessarily completely, but they are highly correlated. And almost invariably you see um, uh, a blue line, which is the real wage index, uh, below and diverging from the level of labor productivity. What that's saying is that the gains that historically were uh, distributed to labor because, of course, that was the uh, that was the the arrangement, and I, I'll talk a bit more about that in a minute when we talk about union non-union uh, trends. Um, and by the way, that 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 link between wage compensation and uh, and uh, productivity that I'm normalizing here in 19 or that's been normalized in 1973 at one. If I looked at these figures after World War II, so let's say post-World War II, 1947 through 1973, those lines would almost 
all correspond to each other. There was a disconnect that began long before today in how productivity is distributed to uh, wage earners and to well, owners of the other large <laughs> input into our economy, and that's the, uh, the owners of, uh, of capital. And I know that sounds a bit Marxian. I don't mean for it necessarily to sound that way. But the reality is that uh, that uh, numbers don't lie. And of course, I've read uh, how to lie with statistics, uh, just like uh, most of us have that, that work in this space. Um, these are not, uh, we're not distorting uh, this information. So you see this good disconnect between the uh, real average wage and productivity. And that's consistent with uh, what uh, many of us have, uh, have found. Um, you can also see um, not only that wages have not kept up, but you can see that poverty rates by regions, and we can focus on um, on advanced economies, and you know, of course, those include the United States. These are largely OECD countries, but uh, it's the OECD experiences are very much in line with uh, with the U.S. experiences. This is from uh, a change in poverty rates since two since 2000. Um, poverty rate uh, between 2000 and 2010. Uh, well, percent of the population, advanced economies. Poverty rate has increased uh, in terms of a percent. Uh, this is since 2010, of course. Uh, since 2000, uh, you see a substantial reduction in Asia, in Europe, in Latin America, in sub Saharan Africa. Uh, you see, since 2000, um, poverty rates uh, increasing. You can also see uh, wealth distributions that have uh, have changed. Uh, these wealth distributions uh, are, uh, of course, across, in this case, the U.S., um, France, um, the U.K., Sweden, and Europe. And these are increases in the top 1% versus increases in the bottom 90% in terms of wealth distributions. Uh, the green is 2010, the blue is 1980. And, you know, although there are um, differences, of course, within the, you know, the wealthier countries, and this is, by the way, uh, wealth described or uh, defined in terms of value of financial assets plus uh, real assets that involve largely housing, less debts. Um, you know, the top 1% of the United States has clearly increased their wealth uh, in the period uh, 1980 through 2010, the bottom 90% in the U.S. have, of course, lost. It's been, I think, very clearly a redistribution. Wealth and income inequality in advanced and emerging market economies. Well, this gets back to the uh, question of, of how we compute inequality. There are a variety of measures, but the measure that is typically used is the Gini coefficient. And you see that in advanced economies, um, you have uh, an income uh, Gini that averages about 0.3, whereas you have a wealth Gini that averages about points, roughly 0.7. Whereas uh, in emerging markets, the uh, income distributions uh, are substantially different in uh, terms of the income, but comparable in terms of wealth. Um, but again, this is a, uh, a uh, clear um, question uh, to me, or at least promotes the question to me, if, uh, if the 
uh, Scandinavian countries are on the order of about 0.26 to 7, and America is on the order of about 0.4, which compares favorably with Bulgaria and I think Iran. Um, something doesn't seem quite, uh, quite right. These are inequalities in health, because of course health and infant mortality, uh, births attended by skilled health professionals are not a small part of the, of the uh, story about uh, how inequality is, uh, is manifesting itself. Uh, you can see that uh, in the um, advanced economies, which are the orange or burnt orange, whatever, I'm not a UT person, but uh, that's what it looks like, uh, have the lowest numbers there. Um, and uh, you see a, a declining uh, figure. Uh, this is 2010 to 2012 uh, for the uh, developing countries, as well as the uh, as well as the uh, emerging uh, markets. Those emerging markets largely are the uh, are the brick, uh, brick countries: uh, Brazil, um, Russia, uh, India, China. Um, you see, in terms of births attended by skilled personnel, um, you know, the uh, emerging markets you know, more or less have stabilized in the uh, quintiles uh, of three, four, and five. Um, there's also a question, of course, of how the financial institutions have been uh, inclusive in uh, the advanced and developing countries. Uh, you can see as a percent of total in 2011, adults with an account at a formal financial institution in advanced economies. Um, well, you have the bottom 40%, the top 60%, uh, those that um, adults borrowed from a financial institution the past year, uh, bottom 40%, of course, is about 12%. Uh, Top 60% is about 16%. Uh, One could question whether financial inclusion is uh, is a driver. All of these, of course, uh, that I'm mentioning are representing uh, potential drivers for the uh, for the income distribution inequalities that have uh, that have uh, become more extreme. Uh, one last issue speaks to the educational issue uh, and and whether or not that uh, seems to be uh, driving the uh, the numbers. You can see, of course, in in advanced economies, the educational genie, which is, of course, the, uh, the distribution of the, the, the inequality of education, has uh, trended uh, somewhat down, but it hasn't certainly been by much. Whereas, uh, certainly from 1950 through 2010, the education genie uh, coefficient has dropped from 0.5 to something quite frankly, which will appears to con be converging to the, uh, to the advanced economies educational uh, inequality measure. Um, and you can see also the richest and the poorest quintiles of, uh, of a population with less than four years of education has been uh, dropping dramatically by the, uh, and the poorest quintile is uh, not dramatically, but certainly uh, not uh, not in, in consequently, in not slightly or in, insignificantly by the uh, by the richest country. Uh, now there's a question, of course, about, and we've certainly heard this, uh, that uh, technical progress uh, and the skill premium that uh, that has accrued to uh, wage earners that have technical skills has uh, been driving. Uh, technical or uh, income inequality. Uh, the use of uh, information and communications technology, as you can see in uh, advanced economies, has been going up, and that rate of increase uh, appears to be, at least for Australia, uh, geometric. With geometry, or geometric growth is, uh, is can't can't be uh, persist forever. But these are trends that are substantially uh, higher. Uh, than, than a, a stable sort of uh, relationship would suggest. And the U.S. Uh, has gone from um, a uh, 
ICT capital services per hour worked uh, of 100 in 1990 to something on the order of uh, 700 in uh, 2000. And, uh, I think this ends 2007. Uh, while uh, the skill premium in selected economies, and these are upper secondary or post secondary non tertiary uh, education, starting at 100 in uh, base year is, or where, where 100 is the, is the base, uh, has uh, you know, gone up uh, a lot, uh, more so actually in Korea and Hungary than it has in the U.S., but you can certainly see that, uh, that uh, the skill premium is substantial. Uh, there is a question, of course, of whether or not uh, drivers of, uh, of inequality are uh, based on trade. And you can see, of course, in these, uh, in these trends um, that for advanced economies, emerging markets, and developing economies, trade openness, um, which is uh, measured by total imports and exports as a percentage of GDP, have been uh, rising substantially, going from, you know, for the developing economy, zero in, in 1965 to something on the order of 80 in uh, 2000 and thereabouts, 2010, 2011. Uh, financial openness, uh, total assets and liabilities as a percentage of GDP have been uh, increasing uh, dramatically. Yeah. And of course, there is the question of whether or not uh, these discrepancies in income inequality have been driven uh, in part by uh, financial uh, chicanery or by some sort of uh, problem with, uh, with trade. Um, there is one last, um, well, I'll, I'll hold off on this one uh, for a minute. So just as a, as a summary, these, the, the analysis that was done in this, uh, in this IMF report, and which is, which is borne out by a number of other studies, suggests that uh, pro, uh, technical progress and the uh, resulting rise in the skill premium, and those are positives for are both, both positives for growth and productivity. And the decline of market uh, institutions, specifically uh, uh, labor union uh, membership, has contributed to inequality in both the advanced uh, economies and these emerging markets and developing countries. Globalization seems to have played a, a smaller uh, role, but one that actually reinforces the technical progress uh, result. Uh, the rising skill premium, which uh, is associated with this income disparity in advanced countries, at least that's what uh, most of the studies that I have read have found, uh, uh, is associated with income inequality. It, it also, uh, it's complementary with uh, financial deepening. Uh, and those together suggest, uh, you know, that there may be policies that promote, that there are that there may be scope for policies that promote financial inclusion that would uh, also uh, provide the uh, possibilities for acquiring these, uh, these uh, more important skill-related uh, premiums. Uh, let, me, uh, let me move to the, um, the formal uh, sort of drivers, and, uh, and I'll speak to some of the numbers here again in, in a minute. Uh, and some of these plots. Um, so let me go to uh, technical change uh, first. So I'm going to go back to this uh, schedule. Um, new new uh, technology, of course, has led to uh, improvements in productivity. Uh, it's increased wealth. Now, I, I might say that there's a lot of the economy that economists, especially in the, uh, in the IT side of the economy, that, that economists have a hard time measuring, uh, largely because uh, most of our measures uh, involve price weights of uh, quantities of services or, or of uh, products that are produced. And when you have something like the cloud, which for all intents and purposes is free, then in terms of coming up with a weighted inclusion of that in GDP or in 
the contribution that factors are making to uh, increasing output, uh, it has a, a minimal role. So there are a variety of measurement issues, and of course these are not issues that economists are, are unwilling to admit to, and we've been working very hard on trying to address them. But no such uh, issue is, is more uh, specific to the question of the information technology and how um, it has uh, potentially led to uh, a rise in, in technology capital uh, demand, as well as uh, in the increase in skilled labor over lower skilled and unskilled labor. Uh, of course, how? Well, it's by eliminating jobs and eliminating jobs through automation or by upgrading skill levels that are required to obtain or keep the jobs. And this has been documented by a number of, uh, of exceedingly talented economists, uh, uh, former winners of the John Bates Clark Award, the outstanding economist under the age of 40, uh, at, at, the, at, the, at the best uh, economics departments. Um, Techno technological advances have been found and have, the, have contributed the most to rising income inequality in the OECD. And they account for almost a third uh, of the widening gap between the 90th and the 10th percentile over the last 25 years at least. This is an OECD that uh, finding uh, back in 2011. Um, and the evidence from larger emerging market economies shows a similar trend. Um, growing uh, earnings gap between high and low skilled workers, despite large rises in the supply of highly educated labor, which you think would, would reduce the gap, but of course it hasn't. Um, we go to uh, trade again, I'm, back in, I'm going back a bit in these, uh, in these figures, but there are two sides to trade. Trade, of course, has been an engine of growth uh, in many economies, and, and it's and it's due to the fact that uh, that uh, you, know, you promote competitiveness and, and enhance efficiency. Um, but trade and financial flows between the countries um, are nonetheless probably always or have been uh, cited as driving income inequality. Uh, in advanced economies, firms adapt labor to 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 use labor-saving technologies. Offshoring has been cited, of course, as an important driver. Um, potential um, you know, trade openness can have mixed effects on wages of unskilled workers. Uh, it raises the wage premium, but at the same time, um, increased trade flows uh, lower income inequality. It does it by increasing demand and wages for lower skilled workers. And in it, disentangling that impact of trade on inequality is, is to be frank, a very challenging empirical uh, exercise. We can, we can talk until the cows come home about the impact of trade on income inequality, but at the end of the day, it's not who yells the loudest, it's uh, where the, where the uh, evidence lies. And uh, to the extent that individuals can obtain income from wages or capital and that uh, uh, Inequality is, uh, depends on relative factor abundance and productivity differences, differentials across countries. Uh, this will continue to be a, uh, a, uh, an open question. Uh, people have their, uh, their strong feelings about it. Uh, economists, of course, are loath to, uh, to put up barriers to, uh, to uh, resource allocation, and those barriers in the form of tariffs and a variety of other trade uh, impediments uh, are things that uh, economists uh, recognize are, are regulatory uh, in, uh, in distortions, if you will, that uh, do not uh, have uh, the long-term positive impact that, uh, that uh, on the surface you might expect it would have. Um, but nonetheless, uh, trying to uh, uh, disentangle these impacts is, is challenging. I might point out as well that you know, trade happens in a variety of settings. Obviously, we can buy things via some uh, uh, supply chain that involves a number of different countries, but we can also think about within our country a, a supply chain of, uh, of businesses. Um, you know, we trade among ourselves in the U.S. economy uh, enormously. Uh, so the arguments about trade and trade openness don't just speak to the world economy. It speaks to uh, our domestic economy, which is on the order of 20 trillion 
uh, dollars. That's not a small piece of change. And uh, the, uh, the question of whether or not uh, one form of trade is less impacted than another form of trade, uh, the argument being that international trade should be regulated more with tariffs and, and trade among ourselves should not, is, is, is in a sense a, a misguided uh, uh, issue. Uh, the question is whether or not we benefit from trade in general and whether or not we're willing to adopt new technologies uh, and, uh, and stay away from the Luddite uh, sort of perspective in uh, 19th century Britain. Uh, we, of course, have a question of uh, whether or not union status and the institutional changes that have occurred have, uh, have impacted uh, the uh, distribution of income. And I think it's fairly clear to say the changes in market institutions has, been, uh, has not been an independent factor in the, uh, in the power uh, equation between labor and capital. Um, labor negotiating the, uh, strength has uh, fallen in North America. And as you can see, it has fallen everywhere. These, uh, these um, plots uh, have, a, you know, they're, they're meant to summarize distributions in as, as clear a way as possible. Sometimes uh, pictures are not worth a thousand words, uh, but each of these lines represents where the median is, where the max is, and where the min is. So you can see, uh, if the, if the median is above the middle, um, you know, there are obvious uh, distributional implications of that. But nonetheless, in every case, uh, we have a union uh, rate that has fallen in every grouping of country. And uh, this is uh, at the same time, of course, that uh, wage inequality has, uh, has risen. Um, what has uh, been the driver in terms of income inequality due to changes in redistributive or redistributive policies. Well, I mean, these are flags. Uh, you can see that uh, there's a big U.S. flag at the top of that. And, you know, right below it, you know, a big uh, British flag. Uh, the change in the top rate, the change in the 1% income share, um, is plotted on that schedule. And you can see, and this is from 1960, fourth quarter of 1960 to, I'm sorry, fourth month of 1960 to ninth month of 2005. That's an enormous change in the top rate uh, relative to the top 1% income share. Uh, and it's not surprising that we have seen uh, via these um, redistributive policies, um, exactly what we would have expected. And that's that there's less redistribution. And less redistribution, of course, uh, suggests more, or at least pervasive and, and persistent inequality or reversing of those uh, trends that I mentioned occurred in post-World War II uh, era through the uh, early 1970s, where inequality and the uh, wage compensation via productivity growth were uh, were quite uh, were quite uh, stable. Uh, okay. Um, well, there is, of course, the uh, decomposition uh, in educational levels that we talked about just a short time ago. Let me just speak uh, to the the summary numbers here, um, and that is that uh, in terms of the decomposition, you can see, you know, in the contribution of these various factors, you can see that for the advanced economies, and those include the U.S., that uh, there has been an increase of about 6% in the market genie, which is to say um, a, an increase in an average of what it started out about 25 to 30, uh, six over 30. And we're talking about a 20% increase in inequality. 
Um, and that's not a that's not a, a small um, it's not a small change. Um, what did I say? I, I'm sorry. We're, we're talking about a six over thirty uh, a change. Um, so we're talking. Yeah. So um, you can see that that, that that decomposition is largely a factor of the skill premium in the advanced economies, um, as well as constraints to the uh, flexibility in labor markets, where you know both of those are driven largely by educational attainment and by uh, access to uh, to uh, educational opportunities, which and involve, of course, retraining if uh, jobs are lost and, uh, and, and the, the, uh, the job itself no longer is uh, one that can be done at an economical level by a, by a worker as opposed to a machine. By the way, the, the largest purchases of, uh, of uh, AI and, uh, and automated technology right now by far is, uh, is China. Um, you see globalization has not a small role either um, technology, um, not so much, uh, you know, a fairly minor player in this, uh, although, of course, the skill premium, the technology uh, are, are, to some extent, uh, not independent, but uh, the, the advances that have gone on in, uh, in uh, various aspects of technology, uh, of course, create new jobs, create new uh, markets, and uh, to the extent that it does have an increased impact, or it hasn't impact at all, it's a fairly minor one. As is, by the way, the uh, the issue of financial deepening, and uh, and uh, you know, whether or not uh, this is largely driven by by the banks and the financial institutions. Of course, better health outcomes in the advanced economies, in America being one of the largest of those, uh, has reduced the uh, the income uh, inequality. And again, this is via the uh, Gini coefficient. You look at the shear in, uh, in the bottom 10% uh, in the middle decile. Uh, again, in the advanced economies, um, well, that's the uh, income share of the bottom 10% in the middle decile. Um, all countries, advanced countries, and um, it's, you, know, you see uh, labor market flexibility, the social policies, globalization, financial deepening, better health outcomes, skill premium, access to education, all of those roles are, uh, are expressed in, in, that, uh, in that schedule. And, and you can see again the, the sort of self-reinforcing aspect of, uh, to some extent, the, the flexibility of labor, labor and the uh, skill premium, and changing the income share, reducing it obviously, uh, for the bottom 10% as well as the middle death center. So, uh, you know, let's try to square the, uh, the uh, issue in terms of uh, what economists deal with, and that's efficiency and, uh, and equity. Uh, lowering income inequality does not need to come at the uh, cost of lower efficiency. Um, and there has been a good bit of work uh, done at the uh, at the IMF, but also in a variety of other settings that shows that this uh, you know, this efficiency equity uh, trade off, which you've heard, uh, I'm sure, uh, given by a number of uh, pundits, is not uh, is is not a stark trade off at all. But there are the possibilities of redistribution through tax and transfer systems. Those have been found to be positively related to growth for most countries. Um, and appears to be negative, negatively related to growth only for the most strongly redistributed countries, which of course uh, America is not. Uh, it would suggest that the effect of redistribution on the enhanced opportunities for lower income households uh, and on social and political stability could potentially outweigh those, uh, any negative impacts. Fiscal policy could be an important tool. Uh, of course, uh, fiscal policy plays a critical role in ensuring uh, macro financial stability, but it can also be used to avert and minimize crises, which, of course, we all know in this last uh, financial meltdown uh, disproportionately hurt the disadvantaged population and, and, and destroyed uh, an enormous amount of uh, their wealth 
which was uh, which was tied up in their housing stock. Educational policies, I think, are fairly clearly the key or a key uh, in, a, in a world where you've got technological change, which is increasing productivity, uh, me uh, mechanizing jobs, then the skill level is uh, critical. And improving the quality of education, uh, eliminating financial barriers, uh, providing support for apprenticeships. You've heard these before, and, and you've heard them for good reason, because they are key to uh, boosting skill levels in tradable and non-tradable sectors. Um, in advanced economies with an already high share of secondary or tertiary graduates, uh, policies that would improve the quality of the upper level education are going to be important. Uh, again, I mentioned the financial inclusion. A safe financial inclusion, however, uh, could be uh, quite a, 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 a important aspect. Um, but, you know, I think to the extent that I've said anything um, that, that has any, you know, that, that you remember, um, you know, I think it's, it's pretty clear, at least from an economic perspective, that the deep social issues are not going to be resolved purely by infusion of credit. Um, they're going to need to strike a balance between fostering and prudent stabilities and inclusion uh, while encouraging innovation and creativity. Um, there, what we'd like to be able to do is take advantage of complementarities between growth and income and income equality objectives. Um, we could develop reforms that are aimed at rising uh, average living standards that can also influence the distribution of income and minimize the downside of globalization and technological change. Um, you know, it would be a policy agenda uh, of the race to the top instead of the race to the bottom. That's an agenda that would include policies that would encourage innovation. Um, and to some extent, although I'm, I'm not a big proponent of this because I think regulations are there for a good reason oftentimes, but uh, some regulations are not. And so it would be, of course, important to look at uh, some that are burdensome and that uh, would stifle competition and technological diffusion. I did mention that there was a, uh, an issue of value that, uh, that uh, started off the discussion, and that's that people tend to view um, inequality as being important uh, based on, uh, on just moral and, and value lines, and moral and, and ethical lines. And I wanted to re revisit that very briefly. Um, by way of a study that was done uh, by Norton and Early, their uh, Harvard Business School and Department of Psychology at Duke. They had a uh, 2011 um, finding uh, from a nationally representative online panel, uh, which was, it was in a Perspectives on Psychological Science, I tend to read uh, fairly widely, called Building a Better America, One Wealth Quantile at a Time. And they asked respondents to estimate the current distribution of wealth in the United States and to build a better America by constructing distributions with their ideal level of inequality. There was a, an online sample of uh, respondents uh, which was randomly drawn. Uh, it's about a million Americans. It was remarkably um, representative in terms of voting patterns, in terms of uh, demographics, in terms of median incomes. Uh, 47 states were involved. Uh, I don't recall which of the, uh, the contiguous states uh, was not there. Um, and the results demonstrated two primary messages. The, the first message, <laughs> I think I've, to some extent in repeating myself here, but just to make sure we're on the same page, Americans prefer to live in a country, frankly, more like Sweden than like the United States. Americans also constructed ideal distributions that are far more equal than they estimated the United States to be. The estimates were far more equal than the actual level of inequality. That was the first message. The second message was that much more consensus than disagreement across groups from different sides of the political spectrum uh, exists for a more equal distribution of wealth. So, it, 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 the study suggests that Americans frankly, possess a commonly held normative standard for the distribution of wealth, despite the many disagreements about policies uh, that affect that distribution, such as, you know, taxation, welfare, and of course, what you continue to hear on the, uh, from the talking heads in the, uh, 
in the various uh, entertainment uh, uh, media. Um, what we can do is we can revisit that distribution of Gini coefficients, and that's what I've done in a, another study, and I'm not going to spend much time on this other than to uh, point out that this um, is the distribution. This was via, um, I think this was a CIA a World Factbook. This was 2010. It hasn't changed uh, in any demonstrative way. But you can see a distribution here. Uh, you've got um, essentially the, the mass of that distribution around 0.4. Uh, and um, it ranges from, uh, well, 20. It's, it, these are actually, the Gini coefficients are normalized here from, from uh, 0 to 100 instead of from 0 to 1. So 20 is the lowest and 40 is the min, is the, is the median. And I think what 70, 75 or so is the max. Um, what I did was look at the information that uh, spoke to this relationship that had historically occurred between productivity and average wage compensation before 1973. And I asked the question, what would have happened had that income distribution, or had the productivity gains uh, that accrued uh, been uh, distributed as it had been in those previous years to uh, wage compensation? Uh, what I found in the analysis was that it would have resulted in a uh, Gini coefficient in the U.S., which currently is about, as I think I said, the, the same number as Bulgaria or uh, Iran, uh, of something like 0.23 or 23. 23 is, in fact, the uh, Gini coefficient for, uh, for Sweden. So I, I think there is scope for the political will that uh, uh, I think we, we based on normative uh, values. And uh, I think that, uh, of course, there's a, a lot of uh, work ahead of us. <laughs> but uh, this is my attempt, at least, to, uh, to uh, address the, uh, the uh, issue from the perspective of an economist and from the perspective of, a, uh, of an economist driven by, uh, by numbers and, and by data. So that's, uh, that's what I had to say. And, uh, I appreciate the time, and of course, I've gone over a little more than the half an hour that we originally talked about, but Virgil told me that uh, I could, so I did. <laughs> well, and, and we have benefited enormously from this very thorough airing of critical variables that have got to be uh, dealt with. Robin, mm -hmm. let me ask you a quick question. How much more time can you have now? And I'm asking that against the prospect that perhaps we can schedule another time uh, when we can pick up where this leads off today. I've been making very careful notes and I recognize the deep importance of what you've given us here. Uh, so is it likely that we can schedule a time, not today necessarily setting the time, but a time in the future when we can pick up right here. But in the meantime, for those of us who can stay on, I'd like us to kind of share, uh, you know, make notes on what we are feeling and, and thinking as we've heard this. It's been so so rich for me. Uh, I, I see so many ways. But Robin, how much more time would you have now? Well, I can I can probably uh, stay on uh, through eleven. Well, I'm on Eastern or Central Time through eleven. So you got another fifty minutes, maybe, huh? Uh, half an hour would be better. Oh, uh, half an hour. Let's do a half an hour. Let me suggest. Let me suggest uh, a way we should do this so that everybody can can get something on the table. I'd like to quickly put an issue on the table that I don't want you to necessarily get into now, Robin, but like it would be an issue that we could come back to. And I'd like to suggest that everybody on who wants to would, would be able to do that as well. Here's the one that I would want to put on the table. Number one, at the time in the life of America, when we had total income inequality, we know what I'm talking about. How has the failure to redress that and fix that uh, now uh, played into what Robin Bird, what Robert Bird saw when he saw his poor people in West Virginia, 
And he said, my people have become poor, uh, have become white niggers. And, and I thought that was a, a very prescient social commentary. I wasn't offended by it at all. I think Bird helped us to understand that the niggerization of America has not stopped, especially in the, income, in the uh, economic area. And I'm not asking you necessarily, Robin, to go deep into that now, but I just want to put that on the table uh, as to how the original in income inequality of America, sometimes called America's original sin, continues to play out now and has trapped, has had a boomerang effect on the whole of society. I just want you to, just a quick comment on that, but I want other folks to be able to put an issue on the table that they would like us to come back to when, when everybody's time will permit that. Well, I mean, I can certainly comment uh, on that uh, to the extent that I have information in front of me that would indicate what those uh, trends were. Uh, I can't, but I can certainly respond to it in, in, a, in a couple of ways. Um, I, I used to be a, an athlete, and uh, I always liked uh, whenever I was having a race or whenever I was playing uh, baseball to, to have a playing field that was level and to start the, uh, start the race uh, all in the same place. And, and of course, um, that hasn't been our history. Um, and the idea that somehow uh, I could run faster or this person was running against me to catch up, even though they started uh, 50 yards behind me, uh, or that, uh, you know, the team that I'm playing that didn't have bats, but, uh, or had broken bats, but, uh, you know, could, could beat us in a, in a nine inning game uh, you know, that, 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 that notion is, of course, absurd. And right. the, the original sin, of course, uh, you know, has been recognized. I, I'm frankly, I'm reading a grant by, uh, by Ron uh, uh, Chernoff right now. And it's, uh, you know, it is a, a, a very unsettling history of, uh, of, uh, of course, the, the uh, war, uh, Confederate War, the Civil War, but also uh, post-Reconstruction. Um, and the only, um, the only time that, uh, at least I've seen in our history, that, uh, that uh, Byrd's uh, comments were, were recognized and were addressed was by LBJ. And, and, and of course, uh, earlier with uh, Kennedy's uh, ideas that were put in practice by LBJ and the War on Poverty. Um, you know those 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 enormous amounts of, uh, of federal um, um, uh, how should I say it? Uh, well, obviously intervention, but also uh, um, enlightenment uh, mm -hmm. changed. Frankly, did move enormous numbers of people out of poverty. Yes. Uh, and then, of course, somehow, <laughs> whether it was because of human nature or because of, uh, of political uh, chicanery, uh, we somehow got smug about the fact that all of those issues were behind us. Um, and I think this, easily this last decade, um, that has been made clear to everyone has not been the case. Um, now, you know, our, our history is is you know, about as unique in terms of uh, of uh, how income inequality has been associated with uh, with people of color. Uh, it's it's as unique as as other countries' uh, history and tradition. So, using other countries as an example is is just not something that 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 has any currency. Um, you know, I. I would like to think that um, the aspect of inequality that is, of course, the biggest driver of inequality, which is the residual, yes. is something that uh, we would focus on and recognize is uh, not only intergenerational, because these are not dynamic models where, of course, uh, you know, the intergenerational uh, poverty is, uh, is, uh, is of course, inherit, not inherited, but is, you know, I mean, it's, it's very obvious that uh, if, if you're poor, you stay poor. You don't have the, uh, the uh, options to, to move to a higher income distribution. There's not as much mixing, as much uh, 
mobility as there had been in the past, mm -hmm. that that's, uh, that that's uh, got to be addressed. You know, I'm an educator. So, uh, you know, I used to think that education would matter, but I, uh, I uh, am, am beginning, be beginning, beginning to wonder, um, you know, just how enlightened uh, uh, education can, can provide, you know, how much enlightenment education can provide uh, in terms of the perspective. Um, Robin, 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 I love you, man. I love what you're saying here. You know, Lyndon Johnson is one of my favorite presidents of all times. I, I, want, I want to make sure that others have a chance to put on the table something that might be on their mind. So I, I'll, 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 I'll withdraw here. Okay. Owen, do you, you have something? I was uh, I was thinking about um, poverty initiatives that I am aware of, uh, both hometown and where I where I currently reside in Richmond. And if income inequality is um, a major factor, it seems to me that the efforts that uh, focus on job creation are simply salves of our consciousness. Um, what do you take on that, Robin? Well, you know, as I said, I, I think when you, when you have a playing field that's not level, uh, the idea of being able to, to somehow converge to a, uh, to a level playing field or to, a, to, a, to, a, to an outcome that, uh, that ignores the initial conditions is, uh, is um, maybe uh, politically uh, um, agreeable, but certainly uh, I don't think is realistic. Um, I think job creation uh, has an enormously uh, positive uh, part, uh, uh, dimension to it when it comes to learning skills, when it terms, comes to learning the uh, you know, work ethic, or showing up to work on time. I mean, there's a variety of aspects of, of job creation, which whether it's in blue collar or middle level jobs that, uh, that uh, are extremely important in acquiring the skills necessary to move to uh, the next level. Uh, being able to have educational opportunities to, uh, to enhance those, uh, those skills at uh, entry level positions that may be, uh, that may be uh, viewed as, uh, as uh, make work, uh, uh, you know, in the form of job creation. Uh, you know, I think would would obviously complement the uh, the uh, the effort. So I don't think that the, the two should be uh, disconnected. Um, all right, I just got disconnected. Are you there? Uh, uh, is... I I can hear you clearly, Robin. This is Amanda. Hi, Amanda. Can you, can you still hear us? I can hear you, but I, Owen has got, just got disconnected. So maybe maybe that's fine. Okay. I, I, I think perhaps he's muted his microphone. Oh, he muted the microphone. Him. That's yep. what I see. Okay. okay. It's, uh, it's, it's, uh, Ralph, uh, does Ralph want to come on and raise something, Amanda? I'm here. Can you hear me okay? You yes. Can, you can so Ralph can come on. Great. Okay. Uh, Robin, first, thanks for, for such a great um, sort of exploration of the data, and I appreciated your national and global view. I think it's, it's really um, uh, important and critical that we look at the holistic um, picture and, and try to dissect and, and figure out how to advance um, some of our work in, in that context. Um, there's sort of a, a few things I wanted to just sort of raise as ideas and maybe as a question or two in there, but you know, th there are things which have come across my radar, such as the you know, there was an Oxfam uh, report or, or piece that talked about 1% of the population capturing 82% of the wealth created last year in 2017. I think they pushed that out prior to the Davos meeting, which, you know, indicates that there's a, a, an ability for this 1% to capture wealth in a very significant way and my assumption is that would be happening year on year so there's this there's that nature or that issue we have to really think about um 
in the question of jobs, I've been very interested in the work of David Otter up at um, MIT and particularly his work on job polarization and how you've had this kind of hollowing out of the middle skill jobs over the past several decades. You've got some upskilling into the, um, the higher skilled job market, but the a majority kind of moving down into the lower skilled service economy. I think there was a, uh, there was a study um, which looked at 2005 to 2015 and the job creation. I think it was 10 million jobs being created and somewhere in the 90% realm was the number of jobs in the service sector, uh, which tend to be lower paid. And I think that there's, there are a number of studies which I think if we brought all of this together could help us create a really rich picture on what's happening in terms of the type of jobs being created, how that connects to income inequality, um, and what we might do about that. Um, at MIT, there's this new initiative on AI in the future of work, which, which Eric Bornjofsen and um, Andrew McAfee are, are leading with a number of other people up there, which sort of indicates the problem of the role of technology and potentially displacing, which again connects to the middle income worker, middle sort of uh, skill bracket that David uh, works on. Um, so there's that kind of role of technology and AI, digital economy, which are which is capturing the attention of many people and my attention as well. I'm very interested in in what these trends mean for our ability to actually provide um, well-paid, enjoyable jobs. Um, but the, when the evidence suggests that the middle income is is bracket is being constantly uh, undermined here and in in many other 16 European countries, I think are the evidence shows it's happening there as well. Um, so if we are locked on the notion that wage income is the way we're going to distribute wealth, my concern is, is you know, that's probably going to be insufficient as we move forward. But we might need other mechanisms to distribute wealth. So I, I agree that, you, you, you know, there's a very important role of work in society but just looking, stepping back and trying to absorb all the data you've presented and the work of others, my question, I guess, is, you know, are we now at a point where we, we need a, another form of income in addition to labor income? I guess that's my question to you. And what, what do you think about that? Well, I mean, I've certainly heard uh, and, and, and thought about, uh, you know, a, a, a minimum income, if you will. Um, Guaranteed minimum income. Um, you know, I, I, I personally uh, um, think that uh, that the, the political feasibility of something like that is 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 so far off in the future that it's it's not at least relevant for a, a, something that I would think about as a as a as a possibility. Um, but but I, I certainly understand the the, the, the argument. Um, but the argument is based on on the, the notion again that the that somehow AI is 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 a game changer going to um, is going to make obsolete um, the um, the need to uh, to have an employment uh, contract. By the way, I was up at MIT this last summer with, with the Economic Measurement uh, Society for Economic Measurement Con Conference, and and Bryn Olson's. Uh, Center actually funded that conference, and and I'm I'm very familiar with his work and with uh, with work of David's and, uh, and many others that have that have played you know work in this space. I used to be a part of the productivity group at the National Bureau before I moved uh, from from Wharton to uh, Rice, um, and you know they they have gone back and forth on this in terms of the, uh, the impact of uh, of AI on on the job substitution uh, versus uh, job creation. Uh, but, but there's no question that the empirical evidence suggests currently that there is a, uh, a substantial risk of premium. And that's something that I, I tried to, to point out. I also tried to point out that there was an enormous change in the, in a more pronounced change, to be frank, in the inequality in wealth as opposed to the inequality in, uh, in uh, earnings. Um, and those two are, of course, um, complementary. Uh, the, uh, 
the idea that um, let's see, I think I have this right. Uh, the employees at, at Disney World, I think, uh, more recent, and I, I'm from Orlando. I grew up in Orlando, so I, I'm sort of familiar a bit with with Disney because both. My sister-in-law and my nephew work there. Um, I think something on the some ridiculous number. I want to say seventy percent. You can check these numbers. Uh, who I mean, we're, we're talking about service uh, service workers uh, are at or below the poverty line. These are these are people that work at Disney World. So you're right about the howling out of the middle of the middle of this distribution. Uh, I have a colleague here, Moshi uh, Moshi. Uh, uh, I'll think of his last name in a minute, uh, who works in um, AI and his, uh, along with people in computational applied maths, uh, who write, who write basically algorithms for uh, AI uh, uh, platforms. His thought is that uh, some 50% of the jobs are going to be, uh, are going to be obsolete and replaced by machines in 20 years. Um, you know, that's a forecast. Um, I remember when geologists were forecasting uh, oil at $500 a barrel, uh, you know, 20 years ago. Um, this is 20 years later. Uh, I'm not, I'm not all that uh, sure that this is as much of a, of a structural change in the relationship between uh, uh, employers and employees as uh, because of, of AI as, as maybe uh, as maybe some might be, um, but you know, I recognize that it's uh, it's an argument out there, and it's uh, something that, uh, of course, serious researchers are doing serious research on. Uh, I don't uh, I don't have any uh, you know predictions as Yogi Berra and Niels Bohr used to say. Uh, predictions about are, are are hard, especially when it's about the future, and uh, you know this is no different. Uh, I think we can use our our logic and say, well, yes, if if jobs are not available because they've been taken over by machines, then there will be less people employed. And that's a fairly direct sort of uh, argument to make, or that people who have only job skills that allow them to use or interface with the technology are the ones that will have jobs, then, then that's a fairly stark uh, sort of future. And uh, in cases like that, I, you know, it, it, it becomes less an issue of economics than it becomes an issue of, uh, of political stability. And uh, that's where I think you would see uh, something on the order of a, a guaranteed uh, income um, um, come in. I, I think it would be very much a political uh, uh, decision. Um, but, you know, my perspective in economics is to look at, uh, at you know, a small slice of this. As I said, the, the, even even with the small slice of this, whether whether it's uh, whether it's um, Jaffe, whether it's Bryn Jolson, whether it's Arthur, whether it's uh, Stiglitz, whether it's a thousand other people doing the analysis, at the end of the day, the latent factors that are determining this, whether you cut it by income distribution within or between groups, whether you look at uh, age cohorts, whether you look at uh, employment levels or employment uh, skill levels uh, within or between, the, the actual amount of variation that you can explain is on the order of about 40%, 60% of that change that we don't know. In fact, it's sometimes more than that, depending on the way you uh, calculate the, uh, the uh, unobserved factors. So, you know, I mean, the physicists uh, get a lot of play out of uh, being able to know about 6% of the mass of the universe. Maybe if we could, if we could get up to uh, a little higher number, uh, it it, no. it, uh, it would be more informative. Um, can I come on? Sure. Yes, yes. Martin Luther King's formula was that we would never have a workable society until we embraced fifty percent of the truth of capitalism and fifty percent of the truth of socialism. I like to think of that as making bread and breaking bread. Capitalists know how to make bread. Socialists know how to break bread, but neither knows how to do both or as one thing. I want to suggest that we be a little more open to the prospect that we don't know enough about how to go where we're trying to go based on uh, descriptions of the past. 
I'd like to uh, suggest that our challenge may be, one of the challenges certainly would be, uh, in my judgment, uh, to look at what I would call, um, let's see, I made a note here, especially, uh, Robin, I want you to take a quick bite at this. Let's say, what could, what would be, what could be the, a prescription or some prescriptions for an emerging, emerging society? that focuses on fostering economic justice. Is, is, is that, is that a, a way to think about this? Uh, um, we're talking about King's idea of the beloved economy. Uh, and we have, a, we have a lecturer on next week who will, who will help us understand he did his PhD dissertation on the prospect that there can be no beloved community without beloved economy in the same way that the chicken and the egg uh, so-called conundrum. If you got a chicken, you can get an egg, but if you eat all the eggs up, you ain't got no more chickens. So the, the, the thing about, uh, about the continuity and s sustainability is how do, you how do you sow the future while consuming the present? Well, I can only say that, you know, in terms of, of capitalism versus so, uh, socialism, um, that you know, our economy is, you know, the, the fact of the matter is we're on the, on the, you know, the spectrum of zero to a hundred, we're on the, you know, hundred being pure capitalism. We're probably, you know, maybe, maybe 70 or 80. Let's say uh, Sweden is more like, uh, more like 60. Uh, you know, it, it takes an enormous amount of effort to go from 70 to 60. Uh, and, you know, I, my own view is that, you uh, is that uh, these are goals that uh, that we we want to pursue, and I think we want to pursue them based on common values that uh, that uh, this country has always espoused, and which, uh, as I pointed out in this uh, survey piece at the very end, uh, is frankly shared by an enormous amount of uh, of people in America. Um, you know, I'm I'm very uh, very much a uh, proponent of, uh, of uh, the enormous amount of uh, externalities that are generated by, by uh, helping your, 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 your fellow person, uh, man or woman. And I, I, see, I see enormous gains of trade from, uh, from cooperation and from, uh, from uh, you know, recognizing that, uh, that we're all in this together. Uh, you know, it's easier said than done. Uh, you know, I, I, I do look at historical information. That's the, that's the perspective I have. So I, I think uh, the, the idea that, that history doesn't inform us to some extent. Um, who was it that said history was one damn thing after another? Um, you know, I think it does inform us about sort of the en enormous amount of inertia there is in, uh, in, uh, and where we are right now and the amount of effort that it would take to, uh, to move from that position. But, uh, you know, at a personal level, as a, at, a, at a moral or value level, I'm, I'm very uh, uh, uncomfortable with the concentration of wealth. I, I do think that, uh, at a, that, the, that the political um, spectrum has become uh, self-enforcing and self-reinforcing by way of uh, the Citizens United uh, decision. And I, I think that there are several uh, sort of legal and, and, and uh, judicial uh, dimensions to this that, that we haven't talked about at all that I think have contributed to, uh, to where we are and where we may go. Uh, I think, you know, having the political um, process that we currently are, are witnessing uh, does not say good things about the possibilities of us being able to, to come together and, uh, and, and make a decision uh, along the lines of what Martin Luther King was, uh, was uh, so eloquently uh, able to express. So I, I don't mean to say that I'm, I'm cynical about the pos prospects, but I do think that, that we have to this from a, of a, a number of dimensions a number of perspectives. And I, and I don't think the judicial decisions, the Supreme Court rulings, the, uh, 
the, uh, the political process currently in place uh, is independent of that. That's all. You, you know, uh, Martin Luther King, when he received the Nobel Peace Prize, his speech at uh, Stockholm said that he had the uh, audacity to believe that people everywhere could have three meals a day for their stomachs. And then you, rec you recall uh, our Lord teaching us to pray for daily bread. And maybe the thing that's missing in all of this is how do you make that happen? I like to feel that King gave us the why. And uh, what we're wrestling here with is the how. The how uh, is the left brain and the why as the right brain. And I like to feel that what you've done here today, Robin, has moved us closer to bringing together the gifts of the left brain and the gifts of the right brain. And I'm just hoping that this uh, conversation uh, can continue. And we are deeply grateful to you. And uh, we are looking forward to wherever this leads. Well, I, I must say that in terms of the left brain, right brain, uh, uh, Virgil, I, I am left-handed, which means I, I should be in my right mind. <laughs> uh, as far as I know, everything I know about you, <laughs> you've always been in your right mind. <laughs> but, you know, that, 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 that point could be debated. That point could be debated. Um, so I appreciate uh, the opportunity to, uh, to meet with you all and, uh, and uh, look forward to the next time. Indeed. We'll be following up. All right. Thank you now. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye -bye.